Good morning. Good morning, coffee moaners. Welcome to you if you're on podcast or indeed here with us on YouTube. Mm -hmm. How are we all? <laughs> um, if you How are you this morning? Um, God, crack it, so these glasses are an accident that he's wearing. He yeah. doesn't choose to wear these Elton John. Yeah, no, I, I left my <laughs> other glass, lost my other glasses in the gym. Uh, well, I can find another pair. No, oh, no, it's fine. You don't like them. He's got no, multicolored glasses on. He's gone a bit. There with any dignity. Uh, no, they're not as bad as one would think. They're a little bit. Oh, they're a little bit. Who's that actress that wears the really brightly colored um, glasses? What's her name? What's her name? One of you will remember. Um, from Heidi High or Heidi Ho. Oh, well, no, you don't. That's what I mean. I would have thought if you told me I'm going to wear blue. <laughs> That's better. better. Is that better? There we go. Okay. Oh, I love those glasses. They're mine. They're not yours. Mark, they're those... mine. They're they're... My... Okay. They were in my bag. Just because they're in your, ba in your bag doesn't make them yours. <sighs> Morning, everyone. God, Let's you know, you have sisters and like all your stuff goes missing all the time. And then you have a oh, husband, your socks go missing, your glasses go missing, everything goes missing. What's quite nice is, is, is rimless or relatively small rimmed glasses suit me better, which, which for me means that I prefer to see my eyebrows. They actually are really nice on you because you don't really see them. That's what I prefer. Nice, nice. Morning, everyone. How are we So, all? morning, everyone. We've got lots to talk about, but first of all, I think we should tell them about Dina's drama this morning. It's quite funny. I just didn't know she had her own set Well, of... hang on. No, don't go to the punchline too early. So, first of all, she was going home and her friend were heading off to Lisbon today. So, they get all the way to Gatwick and her friend realises she's forgotten her passport. So they had to go all the way back to her friend's house. That's a pain. Then her friend didn't have her key. Morning, Crystal. But they did manage to get back to Gatwick for and a huge cost. Cabs there, cabs back. They managed just at the last moment to catch the plane. Then Dina sat on the plane, and this would have been so, Dina is so embarrassed, gets so embarrassed about this sort of thing. She was called to the front of the plane and asked to get off the plane to check her bag. Because it was vibrating. I heard there was a swingers convention in Lisbon. <laughs> Dina, I didn't know. For those of you listening so, who don't know who Dina is, Dina's that's my sister. sister. So, so of course, Mark's been winding her up because she said it's her toothbrush and he was yeah, like, come right. on. But anyway, how many times have toothbrushes embarrassed us like this? I'm I say don't take an electric toothbrush with you. Wherever you go, it always ends up embarrassing you. Do you remember the time... I went somewhere and my bag set off the security machine and there were a pair of fluffy handcuffs. Cuffs, yeah. Why were they there again? I can't remember. They weren't there, there because we used them. No, they were they there were... as a joke. But it was embarrassing because you had to take them out. Deeply embarrassing. And I had to I had to explain them. And I don't remember how I explained mm. them. We were watching um, one of the Housewives series the other day, weren't we? And they had gone away for one night. There was and a dildo taken, and a chicken. One of them had taken their yes. had taken their vibrator. But, but to be fair, one of the other real housewives, and I love the fact that they are real housewives, um, did say, "Can you not go for like forty eight hours without needing to get down I think there it was and do 24. some business?" And you're with all your girlfriends. It's like when are you going to? That's so functional. I know. It just so I'm just going to go upstairs just sick. quickly. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Would anyone take away their vibrator on a girl's trip? Uh, Crystal says maybe it was the cream frother whisker. Could have been <laughs> the useless one, for Crystal. Yeah, but that one you have to do physical action yeah. to actually get it going, Crystal. So uh, I doubt it was that. Oh, imagine yeah. her embarrassment. Don't imagine. Embarrassing. I wonder how they said it. There's something vibrating in your baggage, madam. <gasps> oh, so, so funny. So today we're going to be talking about shyness, in particular to shy, ch shy children. Really want to hear from you if you were labelled a shy child Absolutely. and what it meant to be labelled a shy child. And we're going to talk about menu calories potentially being triggering. I think this pivots around uh, a change in the law or research Scotland in Scotland. Scotland is just about to bring it in on their, in their restaurants. So obviously um, it's been in England for a while now, a couple of years maybe. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Rebel Wilson, Sasha Baron Cohen spat. Is it all just PR for a book? Or, as I've read today, the fact that she posted about this on Twitter around the hashtag MeToo moment, but no one picked up on it. Perhaps this has just been there from the get-go. And we think this is going to end up as a big Hollywood 
court case. Potentially. 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 We don't know. No. Everything is genu- strenuously denied by mm. Sasha Baron Cohen. But anyway, we'll chat about more about that in a bit. Now, last night, we did a wine o'clock instead of a coffee moaning. We'd had a really difficult day dealing with our feelings and emotions around Gaza. And we wanted, we didn't, we didn't feel we could just go in and just do our usual bit of jolliness, bit of this and that, coffee moaning, just didn't feel right. So we went into, in detail, um, the latest um, horrors in Gaza. Although in the end, we didn't speak that much about Al Shifa Hospital, but we did, we did touch upon it. And lots of you shared back. And actually, it was quite healing to get a lot of it off our chest. Mm. So we're not going to go into it in great detail today, but you can watch our wine o'clock from last night if you want to catch up with that. But, um, but yeah, morning. I mean, in terms of this morning, the identities of the three British aid workers has been revealed. Um, I think one of the one of the aspects, they're three of seven, and the more we hear about the nature of this attack or this targeted sort of, you know, killing... Um, the more you rev- the more you hear about the three strikes, the pursuit of each car essentially by these drowned attacks, you can't help but feel this was an entirely intentional assault. Now, of course, Israel has gone to great lengths to do that thing, which is most most di- di- so annoying in an argument, isn't it? When someone immediately, almost too quickly, goes, "Yes, it was us, and we're so sorry," and this is just this is just the trauma and tragedy and awfulness of war. This is what happens," said. Uh, said Benjamin Netanyahu. This is the consequence of war. Um, and great, and thankfully, this morning, we've heard quite a few rigorous interviews mm. with the um, with whatever Israeli um, spokesperson has been put out. And, you know, they have really tried mm. to, to, to push them on the point that the coordinates were given, phone calls were were made saying we are now leaving here. This is a deconflicted area as well. So it's not like where war is raging. Um, there seem to be so many points that need to be answered that at the moment seem unfathomable how you could still, even on the top of the vehicles, you know, clearly the kitchen sign. And, you know, great big bomb, almost like it was used like a target seems to have gone through. But, you know, at the moment, the Israelis are saying that it is an accident. And there is really, right across the world, complete condemnation of what's happened. Mm. Of course, our hearts break for them, them and their families, but also for the 196 other aid workers that have been um, murdered in this conflict. And and I will use the word, word murdered because... Again, we heard this morning, it's very detailed, the coordinates, everything is, is is shared with the IDF of where they're going. And there's been no fuss made about it, really, because they are Palestinians. Can I just also and make, make an observation tragic. that the Israelis have demonstrated on, on numerous occasions the ability with which they can, with such precision, take out, for example, Israeli a, di- army, we must say. a diplomatic building in Damascus from so far away. They have the capacity to hit minute targets uh, at a great distance with, with all the right coordinates. It strikes me as really strange that when it comes to Gaza, uh, they can't employ the same precision techniques that they can employ absolutely everywhere else in the world. Well, today, um, and on the interview on the BBC, their spokesperson kept saying, but Hamas, 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 and she kept saying, no, 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 no. You knew exactly who was in those cars. There was mm. the phone call, there's coordinates, there's this, there's that. And he just kept saying Hamas, Hamas, Hamas. We've got to the point now where we can just say Hamas about absolutely anything that is going on. There might have been somebody there from Hamas. It's not It's not good enough. And I think, you know, there's lots of kind of chitter chatter on all sorts of different sort of social media platforms, you know, people challenging other people to sort of, what do you, what do you make of this given that... You know, I think what one has to do is whenever the question is asked, what about the hostages? One has to ask the Im- immense list of other questions that can be asked back, like what about the 14 to 17,000 children? What about the 196 aid workers? What about the nearly, is it over 200 or the most journalists killed in any conflict? I think there are as many questions to be asked back. So I think meet questions from those who support the current 
atrocities and aggression in Gaza. Just meet, meet those questions with questions. Because as soon as you try to answer, that's how it, they've kind of got you on a bit of a sort of rope, kind of, you know, wiggling. Nothing about this is excusable or justifiable. Everything about this is condemnable. And I think, you know, it's interesting and important that even Nick Ferrari today, this morning, um, has called for the cease, the stopping of selling arms to Israel. Even Nick Ferrari, who himself wow. actually declared at the beginning of a 10 minute section that I just saw on YouTube, he said how he is a, I think he's a representative or he's on the board of a, a charity for anti against anti Semitism, etc. You know, he's quite involved with the Israeli sort of, you know, lobbying sort of, you know, community over here. He said, even despite that, he believes the arms should be not sold. And interestingly, he said, when you look at the microcosmic details of this, there's no part of this that can be justified. However, echoing what Nadia just said, isn't it awful, awful that when it's, you know, to put it bluntly, white British people who are killed, this kind of outcry can happen. But if it's not, and they're Palestinian, or that Israel can continue to kind of muddy the waters by saying, we thought we saw Hamas, we thought we saw Hamas, when I mean, we could say that about everything forever and a day. And if you want to use that to justify killing everyone, then so be it. But it's not that's not a, that's not an approach to conflict or an approach to res resolving a conflict. It just strikes me as sad that if you're brown or Palestinian or of Arab descent, once again, as an aid worker, you're at the bottom of the pile when it comes to the global outrage that we are rightly hearing right now. Mm -hmm. Interesting, just fact. But it has brought some more light to the 196, and there's more discussion about that. So for that, I'm 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 grateful. It's a shame that it had to take so long, but yeah, I think this was. I think this could be a turning point. I really do. Jane Bentley, could I ask, without condemnation, is Israel being bombed? Um, anything that's happening in that direction, I don't think an equivalence at the moment can be drawn. Yeah, that's all I'd say. Total devastation. There is no equivalence. We have one of the most sophisticated armies and military uh, nations in Israel. So I think we can leave that at that. Um, okay, so... Are you going to play the lead button? I can play, yes, this is. Do you want to explain what this is before I pop it up? So this is, this led by donkeys are these fantastic um, Instagram account of filmmakers where they sort of, where they parody and satirize the madness of what's going on. And this was an interview with the select committee by the Tory um, Alicia Kearns, who we, who we like mm, very much. Mm. Um, and it's just reminding us what David Cameron, how David Cameron replied to her question around arms. Very relevant today. So let's have a look. <clears throat> So you've never had a piece of paper put in front of you by a foreign office lawyer that says that Israel is in breach of its international humanitarian commitments under international humanitarian law? Um, look, I, 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 the reason for not answering this question, I can't recall every single bit of paper that's been put in front of me. Very powerful. And then underneath it says, if you can't remember, just publish the paper so we can have a little read to yeah. help you remember. Absolutely. And here's the thing. <coughs> here's the thing. Here's the thing. No one has any shadow or shade of doubt around the illegality of what happened on October the 7th. But it just seems curious that we have to work really hard to demonstrate the illegality of the murder of tens of thousands of people and the absolutely indiscriminate, disproportionate collective punishment in the form of yeah. restricting humanitarian aid. So, you know, this isn't a quid quo pro swap, draw attention to one, draw attention to the other. Things have become severely imbalanced. Does since anybody <clears throat> believe that the death of 14,000 children and, and 17,000 children at least left orphaned is okay? Is, so, is, is a quid pro quo. Yeah. Nobody can, I don't believe there's a single human being who can justify that. Yeah. But anyway, <clears throat> check out our um, film yesterday and let's now move on and Absolutely. move away. Um, um, let's talk about shyness. <coughs> 
Let's talk about shyness. Were you a shy child? Have you ever been described as shy, Nance? It's funny because I would probably say you weren't described as shy, but you're saying Well, you this were. article is all about children and shyness and the way that we we the way that we probably make big mistakes around our children being shy mm-hmm. and with also some some Um, ideas on how we can possibly help so I just wanted to ask first is anybody here a shy person is anybody here was anybody here called shy labeled with the word shy when they were a child did they feel that it helped when somebody explained that they were shy or did it actually hinder them now sadly I asked them one of our daughters this morning, you know, what, how did it feel for you when I used to just explain to people that you were shy, like expecting to say, yeah, it was good. But she said, no, I didn't like it at all. I said, oh, God, why? And she said, well, because it was just a label that I was just shy. Now, when I think back to it, I was quite sort of pumped up because I had so, – and we've spoken about this before with you – because I was so mortified and terrified that my child was going to have this terrible life because she was shy – I I had to do this big like turn around. Oh my God, you know, she's shy. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I had a very sort of one one track way of thinking about shyness. I think because my sister Dina was always described as, oh God, she's so shy. Thank God that is not yet to look after. She's shy. So I was sort of brought up with this idea that being shy was in some way a disability in life. So when I came around to not thinking that and thinking there's so many brilliant things about being shy, you know, that that we just loud ass, loud ass people just don't realise. I then was quite proudly telling everyone, oh, she's shy. And, right. I, and it was like... Well, because, almost like an antidote to your non-shyness. No, no, it was just like, I, I wanted to show that I wasn't now worried or ashamed that my child was shy. And so, and it's okay to be shy. But of course, in the middle of that, there's a child just being labelled as shy. Right. You know, so it was quite interesting that she said that to me because I've only discovered that this morning. Yes. And actually, in this article, it does say that. It um, does I'm, I'm say plopping be lots and lots of comments up as, as we're going. Yes, if you're, I'm if you're watching. for it. Um, and and what, what, what did it feel like if somebody called you shy? Not necessarily in a nasty way, but say like a teacher said or your parents said, she's just very shy. How did that feel? Because I thought I was helping and I wasn't. I wasn't. Good trip, Lollipop. Everywhere we went, my mum insisted I went off and made friends, even if I didn't want to. That's ah, so right. Okay, good trip, Lollipop. Oh God, that's a really good She point. made a mistake, <laughs> but she will have done that thinking it was the right thing like we used to do. And actually, this article is very good on that. It is, like... yeah. Hannah Wood, I was extremely shy. I saw a child psychologist. She looked part of it with being an only child. I went to a rough state school in Manchester, which didn't help. I felt so scared. Oh, Just on that. You see, you felt scared. So it says in this, do look below the shyness. And to find, is it shyness or could it be that actually they're in a very uncomfortable situation and actually they're withdrawing a bit to actually protect themselves because their gut instinct is saying this isn't a safe place. Terribly shy as a child, Lee Dorrant. I just want to say a comment as well once I've read a couple of these. Locked myself away in my room. This meant I had hardly any friends. And when I did go out, no one wanted to speak to me because of how shy I was. Oh, matey, sweetheart, I was going to call you, but I'm sure I can. You don't <laughs> but, want me to call but, you sweetheart. And MeTube, just quickly, I think this is an interesting distinction. Adults would describe me as shy, but I wasn't. I was introverted. I think that's really important. I just want to make a quick comment on this whole idea of, yeah, saying when a child is shy. I think one of the worst things you could possibly do, and I've always felt this, is say, oh, don't worry, she's shy, or you're shy, aren't you? Or it's because you're shy. Because I think what you're doing then is you're you're making a child, forcing a child to have awareness over something that, as you rightly say, Meechoo, might just be a personality detail that isn't seen in those terms. We see it with the kind of hindsight production's ability as an, as an adult in adulthood to go, oh, this is a sort of... But this is just a different... You, you've got a different jam. You've got a different, you know, sort of essence to you. And I think when you then label... I do think... Um, you know, I know there's a lot of kind of talk about words, triggering, defining, all this kind of stuff. But I do think the word shy ends up making you become more of a clam and closing off than you necessarily would do, because you might just be going through a period of your personality, which is, as you rightly say, introverted or quieter or more considered or just not as show offy. But that doesn't mean you're actually tra- in trauma. Well, in this book written <laughs> by parenting <laughs> writer Tanique Carey, she says shyness is often portrayed as being a barrier 
and challenge to overcome. Mm. So if you've ever said, I'm so sorry, they're shy, while introducing your child, you're not alone. But reframing and being less apologetic can be really helpful, as shyness is not a character fault. Now, I think that's really interesting because I didn't think it was a character fault. I thought, oh, I've, I've been at fault because I've misunderstood what shyness meant. So I thought by them proclaiming it, I was like saying this isn't something we're ashamed of, but actually exacerbating the whole thing mm. accidentally. Yeah, no, I mean, and and the thing is, what Lee, what you just said there, Lee, in this article, that's really important what you said, because there is a difference. So like shyness, where you might just be a bit quiet, you might be more reserved, you might want to listen more, that shy people are great listeners is different to to a child that is then is isolating and that is like an escalation that's something that perhaps needs more investigation into it i just want to, yeah. i think that is that's a that's a really big difference mm. and i think that that's when we can get a bit scared as parents go right come on just get yourself out there unless you get yourself out there which of course can just make you retract even more I think this is a really good point, Faith Goodman. Don't compare children to other children. I've always, my skin has always crawled when I hear someone say, by comparison, it doesn't even have to be, oh, come on, like such and such. Haven't you seen such and such is doing this? Or don't, why don't you do, do, do like such and such? It can even be, oh, I love the way, if you just talk sort of about the attributes of another child that you know, and what you're talking about is those attributes of outwardness and, and being a sort of extroverted and go-getter, and, and you're talking about them in sort of glowing terms, and yet that child knows for certain you've described them as shy. You don't have to draw a direct comparison. That child will start to compare themselves unfavorably. So I do think it's really important. I, th I don't think one should ever compare your own children or other children to other children. I think it's one of the worst things you can do because all kids look for, and all we all look for in mental health issues, is difference in a negative way. And we always internalize difference in a negative way. It's pretty funny, much. Isn't it? Because teachers will say <clears throat> that children compare themselves, whatever. I remember mm. when one of our kids was really small and she was struggling quite a bit, I think with maths or something. And I said, you know, she's really aware that she's doing a different, you know, d different work. To she goes, no, she can't be. Mm. I said, well, no, she is. She goes, well, no, she's too young. And, and we are very careful about this. And she wouldn't know that this, and I went, no, no, she does. Cause she, cause she's told us. Mm. And it's like, However tiny they are, it's just human nature, isn't it? Children look at each other and compare themselves. Just, so if we exacerbate it by also doing it, can I just I'm say, just going to pop up a couple of comments because I haven't seen you comment before. And yeah, uh, these are interesting. Uh, Jin Flora, my twin was told she was shy, but now she's older, we found out she actually had anxiety. Mm. She's now thankfully on antidepressant and has come to life and it's amazing. And this mm. one here, Antonia Schwartz, my eldest is shy, and I would always say she was shy when people talked to her, and she wouldn't want to talk back, so it didn't look rude. Since reading that it's not good to label her, I've stopped. That's exactly what I used to do, Antonia, mm. because, because it would look like she was being rude. I would feel bad, so I would, wouldn't want people to judge her. So I would say, listen, she's just shy. Mm. Um, yeah, to, so again, it's about us needing to be, our children to be seen in a certain way, and maybe... Mm maybe we are wrong in that, you know, and that, that actually we just have to let them be. Mm. Um, mm. But I did find the judgment, I felt the judgment sometimes from other people. You could feel them thinking, God, why doesn't she just make her? make friends and make her talk yeah. to people. Nailed it, MeTube says, Mark. And me and my, I and my siblings were raised constantly being compared to our cousins. The competition wasn't amongst us kids, but between the yeah. parents of a certain generation. The ego generation. comes in, doesn't it? The ego of the parents. The playground parent sort of battle. Mm. I mean, it's just hideous. Here's something um, that might make feel be people feel better that might have a shy child at the moment. Research shows that shy children tend to have just as many friends as more confident mm. children. It's just that they may take a little more time to warm up and their friendship circle a little longer to grow. Now, you see, even in that sentence, it's found that shy children tend to have just as many friends as more confident children. Mm. I don't think now being shy necessarily means that you don't have the same amount of confidence as somebody that appears confident mm. by being incredibly loud. Mm. So I think even in that sentence, it's a bit, it's a bit off. 
Sarah Smithard, I was painfully shy to the point of appearing rude. The reason I held that for so long was I didn't want to forget this point because I think one of the other things that lots of parents do is they weaponize shyness and quietness. They see yeah. it. And again, this is a little bit like my post last week on Instagram about bipolar. You know, a lot of people are not willfully trying to present a difficult persona. They are, they within this and within this, there is torment, turbulence, there is a tsunami of emotion that's often being engaged with that you might get a tip of, I don't know, sort of what seems slightly rude or a little bit this or a little bit that, but it is, it is incomparable. And now look, I'm not saying that everyone around that person needs to tiptoe around and be grateful for the fact that, you know, what's going on in this person is huge. But I think with shyness, there's an assumption, when I think of shyness, I think of quiet, silent, still, like a mouse in the corner, not saying much. And I can think of many occasions where I've seen parents in out and about or friends or other people say to someone or, or interpret it. And in fact, I seem to remember when I was much younger and had none of this kind of awareness of mental health issues and anxiety, perhaps saying, what's wrong with you? Why, why aren't you talking? As if it would make the whole situation better if they just talked. Because otherwise, as you rightly say, I'm trying to excuse or answer for a child who seems a bit kind of withdrawn. But it is really rude. hard as a parent because... because there is a level of rudeness if you don't say hello and you don't say. So you've got to, you're trying to navigate that, that at some point they have to look up at people, they have to engage, they have to, because that's going to be the world and they're going to continue to be judged all the way through life. But the difference, so you've got to, you've got to still instill that. But what you've got to shy away from, shy away from is saying, get into the center of things and, you know, just push through and mm. be loud and make friends. I think that's really wrong. Mm. And I think that it causes, Real addiction problems potentially down the line because, you, I mean, you've said this, haven't you? And another friend of mine who was very shy child, she said, I just found drink and then I could get over. I could do that thing that everybody mm. had always wanted me to do, which was just to push through and be in the centre of things. Mm. So, yeah, you still have to be firm as a parent that they've got to say hello and thank you and goodbye. But I think the bit in the middle... You've got to kind of let them find their way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's so many interesting comments. Yeah, People would think so. my child was rude. They're not. They're autistic and struggling in many social situations. So do you say what? Do you say anything, Amy, or do you like do you let people just find find their own way? What? I was shy because of my stammer, says Elsa Pop, and bullied mm. from the age of five till sixteen. Not so shy now because I care less about what others think. Now you see. Now you see, Elsa Pop. I don't think that's necessarily shyness. I think that that is you protecting yourself because you've had, and this is what they try and distinguish between in this article, that there's shyness, you know, and it's okay to sometimes be shy. But if there's something underneath that, like you were being bullied, you know, you were being bullied for the way that you spoke. So you retreated. And to just like, for that to think, oh, you were just shy. No, you weren't. You were, you were protecting yourself, weren't you? You were retreating hmm. and keeping quiet. So that's why it's important as well whenever we think a child is shy to just make sure they might really make that point in here that there isn't something else going on. Yeah, I mean, I remember as a kid, I, I mean, I was forever gibbering, jabbering and always making noise around those, you know, in my family. But whenever I met new people, I'd always go really quiet and almost like, uh, I'd always almost become like a, a, a sniper. I'd kind of walk around the edges kind of, but that, you know, so much of shyness can also, or what's perceived to be shyness, can also be children who either don't feel safe or they feel that there's a volatility there's, to their surroundings, actually trying to kind of keep themselves Smart. aware and they're kind of monitoring in a manner so that they can be aware of where's the danger. Because, I mean, I remember many situations where one was constantly trying to read, who's this person? Who's this set of people? Who are they? What are their intentions? Is my mum all right? Is this okay? Is that right? And then that will present to these people as who's this weird kid kind of prowling at the edges of this social yeah. situation? I mean, I think I think one of the reasons that our children were showing them young is because we were just too much. Mm. We were too loud. It was all about us talking, talking, talking. We've both got ADHD. Where do they find the space mm. to come in? So that's another thing that you can think about as parents. It's like, am I actually giving them space to talk? Mm. Because whatever it's like in the home, they then got to go out. Absolutely. And so I think that played a big part in it. And I think also sometimes 
children like you know if you've got the sort of parents that are picking up on everything you say well what do you mean or da 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 or speaking you've spoken to and then they might turn around and go oh I've got this shy child yes <laughs> but it's like a child is going to learn to just be quiet aren't they Louise then thank you for that yeah being wary of adults isn't always a bad thing mm -hmm. absolutely there's this you know this curious idea that just because someone is say I don't know a police officer they're right or because someone's a judge they're a nice person doesn't or they work for the NHS they've got to be caring it doesn't work like that you know as ch children are very quick readers of the vibe and feel of people and I think you know then sometimes you can be but I do remember my nan would very much try and nudge me out of any 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 element of being slightly reserved she'd, she'd, mm. she'd try and you know, knock it out of us. Ashley Gardner, what, is there a drug that can make you feel more confident well, and less shy? unfortunately, a lot of people use drugs and alcohol. Don't do drugs, they no. don't work. And alcohol doesn't work either no. because then the next morning you're just back to who you are. Yeah, not everyone wants to be loud and out there, says Jackie Bellino. Absolutely right. Just the last thing on this. Yeah. Uh, sometimes shyness, shyness comes because we don't know <clears> what to say or do when we meet new people. So this is very much if you've got children that's shy. Maybe design your own icebreaker that you can play when you enter a setting. What silly questions can you ask? How many people are wearing red clothing? This can help distract your child and give them a sense of purpose. So give them, and I think also if you're having that kind of conversation with your child, you're recognizing that it can be a bit of a struggle for mm. them. Mm. And actually there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I remember when we went to CBT, the CBT council made such a point of ke to keep saying to your children, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. This is just like, everybody's different. And lots mm. of, like I make the point quite often, even now with our kids, what I will say, you see, just then I just looked so confident, didn't I? Because I do, I go in, I, da, 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 I had to do something the other day that I was a bit like embarrassed, a bit shy about. And I went in, I was just chatting away. I said, this is how shyness can look as well. So shyness, everybody in that place will just think, gosh, she was a bit of a loud cow. She's very confident. She's very full of herself. I wasn't. I felt shy. Mm. So so you shy doesn't look one thing. Mm. And so if you're feeling shy, don't feel like you're the only person in the room and everybody else is dealing with life brilliantly. And, it's uh, not the case. And my final thought on shyness is sometimes to be shy is about being quiet and a bit retired and a bit sort of steps, one step removed from a social situation. Sometimes shyness can be about being very discerning. You can be mm. you can be in a group of people who are a bunch of loudmouths talking a load of shit, going nowhere, boring as hell, repetitive as hell, not funny, not half as funny as they think you are. They are, and you sit there, you get called shy, and in fact, you're discerning the fact that this is a bunch of wankers. Oh my shy child is hilarious. She's so observant. Child she often doesn't say a word, but then she will know every single thing that happened, and she will give one line that is just so cutting and brilliant and perfect. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Somebody will go, "Yeah, wow." That and, is and, like... and, and finally, Lee Darren, really good point. Also, sometimes you can overcompensate when you're shy. I do that. Yeah. I do that a lot. Yeah. I will overcompensate in a social situation. And then you I feel exhaust like... yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, okay, moving on because we're running out of time. Calories on menus will trigger eating disorders or could trigger eating disorders. Campaigners urge the Scottish government to drop a dangerous plan as an official report warns it could cause harm. Now, the reason I was slightly surprised by this was calories have been on menus in the in England, haven't they, for, for a, a long time? A couple of years. A couple of years. that long. No? A few years. I, never, I can never work out years anymore. I certainly Ever know since for... <laughs> the pandemic, I, never, I don't know what a year is. They've certainly been in Wagamamas for a while. <laughs> I, always, I never cease to be shocked and horrified by the chicken catsy calories. Oh, so intake. do you always look? Not anymore because I know how much it is. So I just go. Mm, yeah. I don't think it's. I don't know if they're still there, but could they really trigger eating disorders? Do you think? Well, trigger eating disorders. It. I mean, this is a report. Can you just get it up and done? This is a report from um, Beat, isn't it? Is it? Called, are they called Beat? Aren't they? Uh, the report is by Public Health Scotland, Scotland Scottish, yes. Scottish government agency, that say for those with a history of eating disorders, seeing calorie information could lead to a heightened anxiety, yeah. negative body image and a resurgence of disordered eating behaviours. Exactly. Behaviors. So it triggers... So if you're... Okay. And so yes, you're I right. Just... Beat, sorry, the charity, Eating Disorder Charity, has also described the calorie display policy yeah. as dangerous. Yeah. So if I just take... Can I take that down? So if I just take my, my own experience, right? So those of you that know me well will know that I have absolutely zero belief in calories, right? It, it's, 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 it's debunked. I'm just going to pop a, in comments it's up just, as media talk. It's just a load of old rubbish mm. um, discovered like 100 years ago, and even at that time they weren't sure about it. You know, you can choose 100 calories worth of, of Quavers, crisps, rather than avocado because of the Quave, because of 
because of the calorie content. And yet an avocado is going to work your, in your body efficiently. It's going to give you energy. It's going to give you good fats. It's going to do all those things. But you'll choose the quavers or the what's it's because they're less calories. Mm. So, so I absolutely believe that. I absolutely believe that every diet I went on, that I lost weight, I would come off the diet and I would put on more weight mm. because I just don't believe in it, right? Don't believe in it. When I hear other people talking about calories, I'm like, oh my God. And yet, I also know that it can't even be right, the calories, okay? Because somebody else just adds an extra spoonful of oil by accident and you've gone up 120 calories if you believe in calories or don't believe in calories. So I, I know it's a whole load of nonsense. But I will find myself, if you like, being re-triggered to my disordered thinking about food and go, oh, my God. Oh God, what really that avocado quinoa salad is like. And then I'll just, and then I have to snap myself back out of it. So, and I would say I'm much less vulnerable than a lot of people because of my, my way of thinking now about food and everything. So I think it is, I think it is dreadful, absolutely dreadful idea to do it. What came out of this article that I thought, oh my God, I've never thought of that as well is that what it does, and I think it's beat that, that brought this up, mm. is that what it does is it triggers mostly women, because men just don't think in the same way about this, into diet culture conversation. And I thought, that is so true. Because when I go out with a group of girlfriends and, and we get a menu with calories, somebody go, oh, God, I was going to have that. I'm not going to have that now. Oh, it's got so, so. And then we're all talking about our diets again. And then we're talking about calories. And then we're talking about our weight. And then we're talking about, and then we're, we're right back into the whole fucking nonsense of it again. So for me, please, Scotland, don't do it. And please, England, stop doing it. Okay. I mean, my, my thoughts on this, I want to pop this comment up again, just because this really chimes with me. Uh, seeing the calories in Starbucks caramel latte, says Rachel Mason, for example, help me stop ordering such sweet calorific stuff. I think that's a really important point because for someone like me, without wishing to talk about the conversation we had earlier, I'm not as um, wrongly, I'm not as naturally drawn to what it all means. And and I will deal with the kind of crass headline like you've kind of just drawn attention to there, Rachel, which is, you know, I might go in and I, might, I don't go for that kind of a coffee, but I might go for a, a you know, a cappuccino. If I was shown something about the calorific intake on something that for me is like a snack or an incidental, I'm on the move from here to there and I'm about to take it in, the calorie count would really help as a really important reminder for me, like the idea of going for a run and then eating a Mars bar and then knowing, oh, God, I have to run a, two miles to run the calories or whatever I've eaten calories in a Mars bar. Calories that don't make any sense. I think there's a difference between, and how do you manage this? I think that, for me, is I find that actually quite useful. So I don't think it's quite as cut and dry as, as, as we like to think. When I go out and eat, let's go to Wagamama's again, and I do, my eyes do, you know, waver to the right and I see the calorie for intake, that entire lunch is then shrouded in guilt self-hate awful and i do genuinely afterwards go into a place of self-loathing Dark feeling. and yeah. and and i think that is Not right and i wonder whether there could be some kind of rule well where that's what they're talking about and they think that is an eating disorder that no 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 no, no but eating. i wonder if there's some rule about you know snacking or you know places that aren't selling meals that restaurants eating establishments don't do this but places where you are where we're grazing i mean for example you leave... can i just say something on yeah. that latte though yeah it's like i get that but I think we all know that if you choose a coffee with just some milk or you choose a coffee with a big swirl of cream and and uh, and extra sugar and, and cal everybody knows that's not going to be good for you. And you choose to have it sometimes or not. Now, what I do agree with with that is to say, I don't know how much sugar there is in it, but say there's six spoonfuls of sugar, put six spoonfuls of sugar. Mm. Put, put this cupcake that is three times the size that anyone needs a cupcake with this amount of thing, put put 10 spoonfuls of sugar. Mm. Um, but, but I think most of us know that if you're having a lot of sugar, it's not great for you. Right. We know that, don't we? But, but what happens is when you have the calories, you've then been given by the diet culture a stick to beat yourself with. Mm. And actually, it's really nice to sometimes have a caramel latte, but... 90% of the population would know if you have a caramel latte every day, it's not going to be good for you. <laughs> you yes. know what I mean? Yes. So we want people to just be thinking not to have the 
not to have the stick out ready to beat ourselves. And I think if we take that pressure off ourselves and we just enjoy some things sometimes and not all the time, and then we just sort of balance out. And we, you know, everybody knows that a plate brimming with vitality and colour and it's going to be better for you than a plate of chips. Mm, mm, mm. You know, and, and the calorie count of that, what, what's that? That she's slipping into the diet culture again. I do find it, it I, you see, it's weird. If I sit down to eat, it's different to me passing through somewhere. And I kind of do want to, so sometimes like when I used to go to Pret and I'd look at sandwich, I'd be like, oh my Christ, the difference in the so-called cal- But again, once again, like you say, calories of one type of food are different. To ca- so calories in a caramel latte are going to be different to the, the calories of an avocado. Um, and sourdough or whatever. But say, for instance, let me just give you one example. So say, for instance, there's a sandwich that's packed full with chicken, mm. right? Packed full. You've got mm. two pieces of bread, brown bread, you've got packed full with chicken. Okay, and then you might have another sandwich that's got a couple of slices of ham in it. Mm. And you look at it and you go, oh, this has got less calories, this one here with a couple of slices of ham. I'm not going to have this one with all this chicken. I'm telling you now, if you have a sandwich with two thin slices of ham, an hour and a half later, you're going to be starving. You're going to be eating something else. Right. Whereas if you have the big fat sandwich filled with chicken, maybe a bit of avocado, what you've got is excellent carbohydrates in the brown bread. You've got chicken, you've got protein, you've got avocado, you've got fat, feed your brain, feed your joints, everything. Madness. You have hard. the lower calorie ham sandwich. It's very hard, isn't it? When out there at every single turn and corner is temptation to go for something that gives you a short, sharp lift, fires up your metabolism for a, for a, a, a fraudulent couple of minutes, and boom, you crash back down again. Don't get us started on how they don't fill sandwiches to the edges because it drives us all mad. Okay, quickly, we're going to move on to Rebel Wilson claims she felt sexually harassed by her co star, Sasha Baron Cohen. Um, this is all talked about in her new memoir, Rebel Rising. This is the story that on the set of... We talked about the, this the other week, yeah, didn't we, guys? 2016 film Grimsby. She goes into more detail about how she felt Sasha Baron Cohen's uh, mojo, if you like, is about making putting people in uncomfortable situations. Um, and uh, Well, I mean, that is his, that's his humour, well, isn't it? Well, if you think about all of his characters, all of his characters are about essentially taking the piss out of others, making people feel deeply d- uh, uncomfortable... And making them feel, make, making them make fools of themselves by mm. humiliation. It's, it's mm. sort of, it's a little bit like Dennis Penis, who there was a time back there where we were all laughing at kind of really comedy or we were all, all enjoying comedy, which was about humiliating other people. I've never really like, I've never found that funny. No, you haven't. I, I, mean, I, I, I never, yeah. I've, I've just never found it funny. Mm. I mean, with Sasha Baron Cohen, when he did it with really nasty pieces of work, yeah, you then felt... yes, but I don't like it when it's yeah. just a, a person. And um, the part of her claims that I found really quite chilling, though, was when she talks about in the shooting of the Brothers Grimsby, uh, she talks about a moment uh, where she yeah details a particular incident on set where she claims she was lured out of her trailer into an unfurnished concrete room with a mattress on the floor, with the only people in the room being Baron Cohen and his mates, quote, Allegedly, Baron Cohen pulled down his trousers as his friends recorded on their phones telling Rebel Wilson, OK, now I want you to stick your finger up my ass for a scene that he said would be in the film. She said, Wilson, that she was scared. She claimed there was no director or film crew. That wouldn't be able to happen now. That You know, you'd mm. have uh, intimacy coordinators and all sorts of people in the, in the room. But she said there was no one there to observe this. In my opinion, she said, Sasha Baron Cohen gets off on making people feel uncomfortable. We read Baron Cohen's uh, uh, representative who said... What, you know, while we appreciate the importance of speaking out, these demonstrably false claims are directly contradicted by extensive detailed evidence, including contemporaneous documents, film footage and eyewitness accounts during and after the production of The Brothers Grimsby. Um, but apparently, and this is, again, interesting, at the time, Rebel Wilson refused to promote the film. And she says that she was kind of threatened by associates of Baron Cohen, who threatened to kind of destroy her reputation uh, in Hollywood. Uh, and she sort of said, you know, she didn't want to be labelled a troublemaker, though she did claim on social media platform Twitter during the hashtag MeToo movement in 2017, without naming Baron Cohen, she did mention um, she did mention some experiences that she'd had that she was uncomfortable with. And that she with. knew he was litigious, oh, yeah. that, but without naming him. I yeah. mean, he strenuously denies absolutely yeah. everything, of course, but... 
I don't think, it feels like Rebel Wilson is not going to back down on this. I didn't realise she was a trained lawyer or she studied law. Did she? I think, is, am, am I right in thinking? I think Good she God. studied law at, at some point. So she, she's not going to go into this, I think. And, and I presume her publishers would not be wanting this to go out if they didn't feel pretty rock solid. I'm still not clear on whether this is said in the book or whether they are ahead of time. Because I think when you mention somebody in a book, don't you have to get clearance before you do that? I don't know. I don't know what the law is. Well, I think she goes pretty. I don't think she names them. I think in the. Pre, I think That's what, what it, I mean. Yeah, I think we what, talked about this last yeah. week. Didn't we? we could work out whether they are preemptively saying if you name if you you're, you're alluding to him too much, mm. and therefore by that you're. Yeah, you're, she was a law graduate. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, like Nadia says, could this be one of those stories that's going to roll and roll and roll, or is Sasha Baron Cohen going to close it down pretty damn sharpish? I mean, I don't know when this last, these last bits and pieces came out, but, I mean, the last thing that they said was, wasn't it, was that they had evidence. Um, Who? That, that Sasha Baron, Baron Cohen's yeah, team. Yeah, here's his quote just said, And yeah. they have said that there's this phone call, that they have this taped phone call, where they're talking, where she and he are talking about the scene. And she is saying things like, oh, I'll, what I'll do is I'll slap you on the arse and then da-da-da. And he says, oh, yeah, it could look like you put your finger up my arse. And she says, yes. Mm. Inference being that this was all chatted about very jolly, in a very jolly and friendly way. So if that then, t- if she then feels that that's a misrepresentation, I think that we're going to hear back from her again. She seems mm. quite fearless on it. So... I don't see we'll why see. she and would again, want to he resurrect. And again, does deny everything. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know. I don't see. I don't see why she would want to. This. Would, I mean, mm. I, the argument could be it's all about selling a book. We're asking the question: <clears throat> What exactly is said in the book, which would drive you to potentially buy the book? So, of course, it's always tricky when a, a, a memoir is being published. To where's the kind of PR? She in doesn't this? seem the type. Mm. to just be making up stuff to sell a book. Though, <clears throat> I she? also think they would also, as you rightly say, want to make sure this was absolutely watertight. But as yeah. you say, maybe the name attachment has only happened outside the book. Yeah. And so the book itself is a sort of, is legally safe. But I think it's going to roll on and on. Yeah. Do you think we could have a, 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 a big case? I don't know. I don't know. I find that description of that scene of being taken into a concrete room with a mattress said to be true, of course, they deeply, say it's not. deeply disturbing and yeah. striking if remarkable true. parallels with other things. Mm. Um, okay. Um, so on that note, we are going to Amanda Robinson. Welcome as a new member. Bethany Kemp. Welcome as a new member. Um, we need to sing them a song then. Well, yeah, we haven't done that in a while. You might not know this, Amanda and Bethany, but we do sing. The most appalling welcome song. If you join, if you become a member live on one of these and your name pops up, we will sing it. It doesn't happen for everyone who becomes a member outside of a live. So why don't you mangle Amanda Robinson's name? Welcome, Amanda Robinson. Rob, Rob, Robinson. Welcome to the family area. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> it might be that actually you were a member, you went away and you came back. Because what happens is if you don't want to be a member for a little bit and you come back, uh, YouTube will carry on totting up your time. And of course, at five years, uh, five year members are going to be getting these lovely, lovely uh, enamel badges. But I'm now going to sing Bethany, Bethany, Bethany Kemp. Welcome to the family guest area. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the family guest area. guest area, Bethany. Oh, God, that didn't go well with my bipolar mitts. It really <laughs> hurt my head. All right, guys. Have a lovely day. We're now going to hit the end stream and we're going to sit here waving for a moment because that's the